students, welcome to Lecture 5, Episode 3, um, The Transformation of Global Energy Systems, Transforma uh, Challenges and Solutions. Uh, today we have with us Professor Schmidt, who just uh, delivered a fantastic lecture. And uh, we're going to be asking him a few questions uh, to clarify and expand uh, our view on the transformation of energy systems. Professor Schmidt, thank you for joining us today. It's a big pleasure for me. Um, first of all, um, thank you for this really fascinating presentation. It was also very technical. So I think there are um, three terms that I would like you to, a bit, to explain a little bit uh, that I didn't understand quite well. Um, what is primary energy demand? Um, and also direct generation, and finally, the concept of cradle to grave. Okay, let's begin with the first one, primary energy. What is primary energy? Um, it's a question of definition. There are different definitions, but uh, let me try to make it as simple as possible. Suppose we are trying to produce electricity. Normally, today, the standard way is to have a power station which is fed uh, by coal. Mm -hmm. So the input is coal and the output is electricity. So the amount of energy which is entering the power station in the form of coal, that is being called primary energy. The electricity coming out is called secondary energy. And the difference are the losses in the production process of the power plant. Now, the second question was direct production of electricity. Direct production takes place via a windmill. You simply have the wind blowing, uh, driving an electric generator and electricity coming out and practically no losses are existing as it is the case in a power station in which most of the primary energy is wasted to the ambient. Roughly two-thirds of the primary energy is waste and one-third is useful electricity. By contrast, in wind energy, there is no waste. It's directly produced energy without those losses and the electricity which is produced is also being called by definition primary energy in contrast to the power station where we have electricity as a secondary energy. Okay. So it's quite difficult, but I hope it was clear enough. It was clearer, yes, thank you. And mm. about the concept of cradle to grave? The concept of cradle to grave takes into account all elements which are connected to the production of a, a system and the operation of a system and the dismantling of a system and the handling of waste and so on. To give you an example, let's take a, a car. Um, when looking to the CO2 emissions of a car, um, as an example, uh, a Volkswagen Golf type, um, where I know the figures, if you are driving typically 200,000 kilometers, you are emitting about 20 tons of CO2 versus Volkswagen. If you take into account the production process, Without driving one kilometer, you have 10 tons of CO2. And that means looking only to the car and uh, the consumption of fuel, then the CO2 emissions are 20 tons for the whole lifetime. Cradle to grave means production and also waste processing and so on adds another 10 ton. So it's not neg negligible, it's one third of the total and it's becoming more and more important. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask you, at the beginning of your lecture, you showed um, different models of uh, the energy mix in 2050. And they had different components. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit why these models are different, why some energy sources are included and some are not, and why some are more prominent than others. How does that work? Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the diagram, which uh, I have presented right at the beginning of my lecture, you could see the history of energy consumption during the last 50 years, and then um, a simulation result for the year 2050. And uh, the results are not predictions, they are scenarios. Mm -hmm. And so Different scenarios are produced under the assumption, for instance, um, using as much as possible gas instead of coal, or um, using a, a so-called CCS technology, which means um, to take out the CO2 from the production plants and to store it under the ground, or to have as much as possible bioenergy, which was also a scenario. By contrast, the scenario which we have been producing um, in our flagship report was based on the assumption no conventional energy at all, based on 100% renewable energies, and uh, the result has shown that this way the highest total efficiency could be obtained with the lowest amount of wasted energy in the conversion processes. Okay, thank you. Um, and linking a bit to this, uh, I was wondering, there's a lot of, of talk about the availability of, of natural resources like oil. Um, and looking at those, um, those not predictions, but um, models of how the future could be, those scenarios. Um, how do you see the idea of peak oil, the idea that these natural resources that are non-renewable -re are going to run out at some point? How do you see this in link to those scenarios? Well, it becomes now more and more clear that th despite the fact that those resources, the conventional resources like coal and oil, are limited, um, is it is not possible, it will not be possible to use those resources to a full extent because of the CO2 emissions which are uh, associated with the use of those sources. If we would be using all the known resources, uh, the CO2 concentration in the global atmosphere would uh, reach uh, values uh, where we could expect temperature rises of 5 degrees Celsius or even more. That means the limitation is not the availability of conventional sources, the limitation can be seen in the emissions associated with the use of those sources. That is a strong argument to introduce renewable energies as fast as possible. Indeed. Um, and so when we look at, at um, normal use of energy uh, for electricity, you showed this, this load curve in Germany. Um, what would happen if we had only renewable energies? What would happen if Let's say it's a day where it's really sunny and the wind is blowing and it's uh, also a holiday so everybody's out in the park having a picnic and nobody's at work so there's no or very little electricity being used. What happens with all that energy produced? Well, that's a very interesting question. We have uh, been looking to Germany as a whole and uh, we have now an installed power of only wind and solar which exceeds the minimum um, demand mm -hmm. of power. That means such a situation which you have been describing can occur today, it will occur today, but that does not mean that um, 
there is a waste of energy because we have our neighbor countries. And uh, the surplus energy produced in Germany currently is flowing to our neighbor countries. Uh, you cannot control because it flows like a water uh, to uh, where it's between the, the, the areas uh, where they are produced to areas where they are used. So uh, all our neighbor countries are being used or misused to compensate for the fluctuations and there are in fact uh, coming more and more complaints from the Netherlands, from the Czech Republic, uh, from Poland um, and they are trying to build up measures in order to avoid those energy flows, undesired energy flows from Germany. But in a later stage uh, this compensation um, will no longer be possible and then you have only two, uh, two means to compensate. One is to shut down the windmills and the photovoltaic plants, which um, is already the case today. So we have some losses, but it's, it's less than a tenth of a percent today of Germany's electricity, and this will increase. A second uh, alternative is to convert the surplus electricity into gas, which also was presented in my lecture. Uh, this is quite a recent process, but it has a potential to absorb all surplus energy which uh, is being produced even in a 100% scenario. Yeah, I have to tell you, I had never heard about this gas storage and I was completely um, amazed by the, pos the potential of such a, of such a storage and um, I, I wanted to know how did you come up with that idea? Well, the, the, the elements of this idea are, are not new. Uh, to produce methane, which is uh, what we find in our natural gas, um, based on hydrogen and CO2, this is a, a well-established, old, known process, which is called Sabatier process. Sabatier is a French uh, chemist who uh, described this process more than 100 years ago. But the application for the power sector, that is something which is new. You, you know that you can produce hydrogen by splitting water uh, using electricity. This is very well known. But the difficulty with hydrogen is there is no direct use. You have no engines in the cars. They cannot drive with hydrogen normally. The power stations cannot not operate with hydrogen. You have no distribution system for hydrogen. And that was, that, that was a barrier so far. But when, when now converting hydrogen into methane using this so-called Sabatier process, um, you, you can use an existing infrastructure and that has brought the breakthrough in using this gas producing process. Fascinating. I also thought it was very well explained in the lecture because it's quite complex, but... Uh, it is, in fact. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> um, and also, um, you mentioned how the surplus electricity was going to Poland and the Netherlands and they didn't really want it and didn't know what to do with it. But you also showed this big map of Europe and North Africa with all the sources of renewable energies and how they could be connected to each other. So this. Uh, this grid expansion you called. And um, you were talking about it with the energy flowing from one side to the other side as a very easy and fluid process. And I wanted to ask you, is it, is it really so easy? Like, can really a wind turbine in the North Sea go power a washing machine in Spain? Or how does it work? Uh, in future, yes, it can. Uh, it cannot. Uh operate with today's electricity system. We have an alternative current in our electricity grid. Um, it changes its polarity uh, 50 times in a second. That is the so-called 50 hertz uh, okay. electricity system. Uh, with this system, 
you cannot transport electricity over larger distances rather than 1,000 kilometers uh, without having substantial losses. The uh, supergrid which I have been showing was based on direct current, direct current, the same kind of electricity we have in our car. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you can then realize large transportation systems. For instance, we calculated the losses of a transportation of electricity from northern Africa to the center of Germany uh, over a distance of about 4,000 kilometers, and the losses were below 10%. You see, it's then easily possible to transport big amount of electricity over big distances. It seems very prom promising. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is with those big projects for renewable energies, they, these renewable energy power plants, so to say, so wind turbines, solar panels, they take up a lot of space. And, uh, there has been already in the US problems with wind turbines and this phenomenon of not in my backyard. So people are not against renewable energies, but they don't want to see the wind turbines because they say it uh, destroys the landscape or it makes noise or things like that. So how, how would you address that problem? First of all, uh, people have uh, to be accustomed to this new visual impact. Uh, when you are looking to rapeseed fields, it's something which we have not seen 100 years ago. Um, if you are looking to the skyline of our cities, uh, was not existing before. We get accustomed to that um, from time, to, and, and it becomes uh, more and more accepted, but nevertheless, um, there are new developments. Um, for instance, wind turbines are becoming higher. The masts are becoming higher, which allows us to install them into the woods, mm -hmm. uh, where they are more or less invisible, because people do not live inside uh, the woods. Um, then uh, we go more and more offshore uh, with large distances, um, the first wind farm in Germany, the offshore farm, is 60 kilometers outside, so from shore. You cannot see it. And you can even go farther by using a recent development, which is a floating structure of a wind turbine, where you can install them in water depths of up to 1,000 meters, if you want. So we have no limits in putting those sources in areas where acceptance problems are not uh, existing. Okay. And then who will pay for all this? Because you mentioned I'm, I'm very um, impressed with the potential of renewable energy and all the emission reductions that it will bring and the obvious efficiency gain that you describe uh, and all this kind of renewable energy mix, making it possible to switch to 100% renewable energy, but who will pay for that? Well, um, I have uh, also shown that uh, on the long term, such a system becomes cheaper if you are comparing it with conventional energy systems. But for the next 15, maybe 20 years, you have to invest more. And uh, there are different models uh, existing, but one very elegant model we have applied in Germany uh, with a renewable energy law, which means that all the consumers of, of electric energy must pay the extra cost for those who are willing to install in photovoltaic plants, in wind turbines, in modern biomass systems, and so on. And exactly those consumers they will benefit from cheaper electricity prices after 15 or 20 years if they are still alive. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, mm. And I think as, as a closing question, I, I believe from your biography that you started out as a nuclear engineer. And I just mm. was curious uh, what made you change to uh, 
researching and inventing new things to push renewable mm -hmm. energies forward. Well, um, to begin with, when, when, when I was a young researcher, I was fascinating, fascinated about uh, the perspectives of atomic energy. Uh, enough energy for the world, a clean energy, um, was, was it called, um, the, the most uh, brilliant uh, researchers went into that sector and I was fascinated as well. But um, after, after a time, uh, we began to think about what, what, what are we going to do with nuclear waste? That was the most uh, striking uh, problem and we could not find a solution for that at uh, that time. Uh, safety issues, especially uh, questions about misuse of nuclear uh, material and so on, the so-called uh, proliferation question associated with that. And uh, more, and the, the more I, I dealt with this question, the more it became clear, well, this is not a sustainable technology, it's not a clean technology, um, it has a lot of risk and so on. And uh, then in, during my summer holiday, I have been writing a book about solar energy and I was so fascinated that I, I lost half of my salary and uh, changed over to solar energy research. So that means it was less salary, but very much more fun. And this fun is still existing today. Thank you so much, Professor Schmidt. Uh, this was very insightful and helpful. Dear students, I hope uh, you had a good time during this interview and that it answered some of your questions. And um, see you next time. I hope you, you, hope you enjoyed the lecture and the uh, discussion. And I wish you much success. And I hope that you will be able to contribute to the transformation of our energy system for the benefit of you and uh, for the whole world. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>